So um, they used to have all these bands used to come out from Amsterdam. I used to, I used to sort of, um, I used to give away flowers and work in the bar at this time, and I'd paint the wagons. And um, they had all these bands used to come out from Amsterdam that were uh, playing in this sort of this sort of extravaganza, and. Um, They'd, uh, they'd all ask me to write down the words for all the songs because they didn't know them in English, which is quite cool. <laughs> But, um, yeah, one of the bands that came out there was, um, was a band called uh, Dave Brock's Famous Cure, and they were playing there. And I met Dave and uh, Mick Slattery, and they, I think they were both on, their own, on the run at the moment. For The police were after them for... Um, having dealings with young girls, I think, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, you know, we piled up and we sort of, you know, had a nice time together and then sort of, um, I just kept in touch with them after that. And um, then I went to Berlin around this sort of time and I met all these free jazz musicians who sort of, they said, well, you don't have to be technical to express yourself. And so I sort of thought, wow, you know, I'll play free jazz in a rock band which is what I did, <laughs> and I kept in touch with these guys, and um, and then we, they told me they were getting a band together, and I had this van that I used to drive around in, I used to live in the back of it, and uh, I said, oh, I've got a van, you know, we could, I can be a roadie, and I said, oh, okay, and I'd previously learned to play the saxophone after a fashion, and uh, I sort of happened to have it with me, and they said, oh, I said, oh, I've got my sax with me, shall I play it? They said, oh, yeah, have a go. So I got my saxophone out and we played this sort of weird music and, um, and uh, I played all this free jazz and they said, wow, it's great, do you want to, do you want to join the band? <laughs> so I thought, it wasn't Hawkwind at the time, it was called Group X and then we went and did this gig down in, um, we gate crashed the gig that was involved with um, John Peel and um, we went to so the All Saints Hall, we were rehearsing at the Royal College at the time And um, we, everybody's saying, oh, let's do and go, let's go to this gig and let's play there. And we just go there and storm in. So we went down there and we said, oh, can we play for 10 minutes? And they said, oh, oh, I suppose so. Nobody's playing at the moment. So we just sort of set up our equipment and then played this one song, which is called, um, we called it Sunshine Special. How'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, it's actually a John Coltrane riff from, and, uh, and the birds used it in that song Eight Miles High they were sort of stranded in the desert the only record they had was a John Coltrane record of uh, Africa and India and I think so we played this song and um, we all got really stoned before we played this just became the sort of habit of uh, what we did <laughs> and um, <clears throat> And John Peel thought it was great. I think he thought we were punks before there were such things. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and he sort of recommended the organisers of the event to, uh, to give us a management deal and try and get us a record label and, and all these sort of things, which uh, they did. So then we went in the studio. We then called ourselves um, the Hawkwind. Uh, it was a sort of mixture of... Um, my sort of habit of, um, of clearing my throat and farting. <laughs> uh, but it was also influenced by Michael Moorcock's um, creations because he, there was a character called Hawk Moon who that's all he did was to clear his throat and fart. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> And so, yeah, we sort of uh, got involved in this band. We just said, take any gig we could get. And um, it was great fun. It was Dave Brock, it was myself, it was John Harrison. Um, unfortunately, he died a little while ago, I'm told. Um, bless his soul. He was a very nice man. He used to play with um, Joe Lusty's orchestra. And so we, this, this was a group of people that were very disparate. We had Terry Ollis, whose, whose family were scrap metal dealers. And um, we had um, Dick Mick, who I'd met in Margate, who was a speed dealer, but he sort of reformed. <laughs> he, re <laughs> he, reformed <laughs> he reformed to play in the band. <laughs> and um, who else did we have? Oh, uh, 
Oh, um, we had a mixed lottery as well, yeah. It was a really quite a jolly band, because I'd met him in Holland. And, um, yeah, it was really cool. We used to do any gig we could get. We'd just play everywhere. We'd do free, benef we'd do free gigs, benefit gigs, anything, or just play for fun. And um, we got involved with... Um, Robert Calvert was a mate of mine from Margate, and uh, he and I used to go out and get drunk and stoned all the time. And um, then he was a manic depressive, and he he was sometimes extremely exciting to be with because he wouldn't stop talking, and he just sort of completely wear you out because he'd stay up for five days, and you'd have to sort of sit with him and listening to him for <laughs> till you passed out, you know. And um, and he turned up in London. Yeah, you know, I mean, he was one of the guys that used to come in my car when we had ten people in my VW. We used to go to London to score as well. And um, Robert came uh, to London, and um, he saw that I was involved in the band. I said, "Oh, you know, you can join my band if you want sometime." And um, he thought that was a good idea. But he um, he did some. He was doing. He was very had li had literary aspirations. And um, he was doing some work for this um, underground newspaper called Friends, and Michael Moorcock was also working on this Friends magazine, and uh, Robert was a great fan of Michael's. And so um, Robert got involved with the magazine doing editorial on science fiction stuff. And, um, and Robert met Barney Bubbles, who was the art director of the magazine, and he introduced me to him, and we got on really well. He um, we found we had such a lot of things in common about the sort of astrology and astronomy and sort of mythology and and um, he invited me to live at his house. He said I couldn't sleep in that cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> so I slept in the cupboard in his house for quite a time and this is a... <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> just a big enough to sleep in. And um, he was... <laughs> He was um, he was a fantastic designer, and I was really impressed with his work. And I thought that we we had a record coming out because we'd made um, original um, Hawkwind record, and we'd been in the studio and just recorded the whole band playing a gig, did that twice, and then picked out the best bits and had Dick Taylor playing on it, the guitarist from the Pretty Things. And so we we put that album out. That was really cool, and then. We were going to put a new album out called In Search of Space. Well, Barney called it In Search of Space. He called it X In Search of Space. And um, he and Robert put together this booklet, which was all based upon uh, weird and wacky science fictional sort of ideas and um, theories, to, 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 with, to, in, 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 coupled with a lot of sort of mythological sort of um, ideas from all different mythologies. And um, and Barney had the idea of um, Robert as well had the idea of creating a spaceship that had become two dimensional, and that was what the album cover was. And the um, the re the plastic disc in in it was the record and the dreams of all the people that were in the spaceship. So um, Robert became involved with that, and uh, he and Barney put the thing together, and the band put the music together, and we went in the studio and. Um, Oh, um, Dave Anderson said, I've got this great riff, have you got any words? And I said, oh, what riff's that? And he said, uh... <laughs> it looks quite, sounds quite familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> this into that third person sort of thing that I was talking about because originally I wrote it like I am the centre of this universe, me, I am the centre of this universe. <laughs> the wind of time is blowing through me <laughs> and it's all moving relative to me. <laughs> It's all a figment of my mind 
in a world that I've designed. You can join in. I'm charged with cosmic energy. And has the world gone mad or is it me? Yeah, so um, Dave Anderson said, yeah, I've got this riff. And I said, oh, well, yeah, OK, I've got some words for that. They'll do. I went in this poetry, you know, I write poetry all the time and it's nice to find some words that, um, uh, that fit <laughs> a song, song that fits the words. I don't know how a lot of people write. I think it's actually easy writing songs if you write the tunes with the words. So I'm going down tomorrow to whatever, do, do you know what I mean? Rather than writing words and then having to try and find a rhythm that fits with it. <laughs> Although I did write brainstorm as a thought of them. No, but can somebody say brainstorm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't play that anyway. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, Dave Brock said, Oh, I've got this tune. I said, Well, how's it go, Dave? <laughs> I said that uh, reminds me of another tune that I heard lately <laughs> that um, <laughs> Dave Anderson told me he'd written it. Oh, Dave Brock said, I wrote it. <laughs> so I said, well, I, I, I won't argue with you, but do you want some lyrics for it? <laughs> he said, yeah, done. <laughs> So anyway, we did a lot of songs like that. A lot, um, it was quite fun, you know. Um, I, I did, I think I did another one which Dave Anderson said, "Look, I've got this, I've got this riff, Nick." I said, "Oh, how's that go, then, Dave?" future come that which has dreamt of in the past where minds communicate with love minds which end wisdom to the last we are the children of the sun and this is our inheritance. No longer chaos and confusion, but love and laughter, song and dance. And etc. Um, yeah, we produced the album, and um, um, Robert and Barney designed the cover. And then we put the thing together, and it, and it was great. We got it's, people loved it. I loved it. <laughs> it sold quite a few records, I think. Um, but then the, there was all these problems within the band. You know, you sort of might have noticed the number of the sort of turn up turnover of um, the personnel in the band was quite quite large, really. You know, we started off with um, John Harrison and Mick Slattery in the band, and then then they gone. And we had Thomas Quimble playing bass, and we had Hugh Lloyd Langton playing guitar, and then um, Dave Anderson played bass, and then um, and then Lemmy played bass, and then um, uh, um, <laughs> Dick Mick left. <laughs> oh yeah, Dick Mick and Del were in the band as well. I forgot to mention them. <coughs> Yeah, so we had quite a lot of turnover in the band and, um, you know, they came and they went and they came and went and um, and Dick Mick came along and said, oh, my mate wants to play the, in the band. Uh, I said, oh, does he play bass guitar? Because Dave Anderson has just left. And um, and he said, no, he um, he plays guitar. He, but he learnt, he learnt to play guitar roading for Jimi Hendrix. 
I said, oh, that sounds interesting. What's his name? He said, oh, Lemmy. Oh, okay. So uh, bring him down, and then he came down to the studio. He didn't have a, he didn't have a bass, but, but Dave Anderson had left his Rickenbacker in the cupboard. So, um, so Lemmy borrowed Dave Anderson's Rickenbacker. And, um, and then at this time, Robert Calvert was sort of designing this, um, this, uh, this epic um, extravaganza, which he called the Space Ritual. <coughs> and um, so uh, Lemmy was involved now. And one of Robert's songs was uh, well, out, out of the space ritual was a song called Silver Machine. And um, we went into the studio. I didn't think it was a particularly good a pop song, but um, we went into the studio and recorded it. And um, Lemmy did the vocals. Um, he claims that he everybody was jealous of him because he did the vocals and he'd only just joined the band. Well, I didn't care. <laughs> and, yeah, and um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so. So we put this um, this new show together, the Space Ritual, with uh, Barney Bubbles and um, Mike Moorcock was involved. Robert Robert Calvert started doing poetry readings with Hawkwind, and um, and he was going in this sort of space direction really. Uh, we 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 had Mike Moorcock doing readings as well when uh, when Robert couldn't make it, and um, and Mike Moorcock sort of contributed quite a lot of his stuff. It's all very exciting, really. It's quite wow. I thought, fucking hell, all I was doing was for selling hats on Margate Seafront. No, and um, yeah, so we sort of put the show together with this guy, Liquid Len, who'd um, Jonathan Smeaton, who was a sort of lighting genius, I suppose you call him. This was quite amazing. Him and Barney put a lot of lighting ideas together that were really fantastic and. Barney sort of worked out this whole astrological sort of um, idea about the um, the space ritual where he had the positions of everybody in various members of the band in different positions on the stage relative to their star signs and uh, with the corresponding color that went with their star signs as the predominant light that was shining on them and um, and uh, Barney sort of been it sort of incorporated it within the um, the Pythagorean music of the spheres. Five minutes. Oh, I've got five minutes. Just it took a ride on a silver machine, and I'm still feeling uh, extremely fucking mean. Do you wanna ride? Do yourself going by the other side of the sky? I got a silver machine, it flies. Sideways to time, it's an electric line to your zodiac sign. It flies out of a dream. It's antiseptically clean, 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 a silver machine. I got a silver machine. I've got a silver machine. I've got a silver machine. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then, um, yeah, during this, uh, we did this. <laughs> thank you. Oh, I love you too. Thank you. You're really lovely. Um, I'll just sort of um, round off with, um, I'm just trying to think of, um, uh, well, we just, uh, I'll just continue this story, really, um, about the, um, the space ritual, <laughs> about the, the, the making of the space ritual. We had these very, very interesting and very creative dancers with the show. We had um, Miss Stacia, who was, was a very statuesque, sort of very lovely lady with... Um, 
she was um, every schoolboy's fantasy. She was very large and she looked even larger standing on a stage. And she had huge breasts and she used to dance around naked, covered only with body paint, much to the excitement of everybody. <laughs> and I used to dance with her in a, dressed up in a green frog suit, which was covered in <laughs> astrological sort of signs and, uh, and stars and moons. <laughs> five minutes, oh, I had a reprieve. It was five minutes, five minutes ago. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and we had a, a, a young um, American girl who was a, a sort of a contortionist and um, acrobatic dancer. Her name was Miss Renee. Yeah. She was from San Francisco. She was a lovely girl. She was a friend of the Grateful Dead, but um, she had no teeth. <laughs> 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 Seriously. <laughs> um, she was, no, I won't be saying anything rude. I don't like to talk about people like that. Um, so, um, yeah, we put the show together and we had a, a mime artist, Tony Carrera, who was...